Last time, we talked about the basics of GPS and how all of that communication worked in an ideal sense. But what about the non-ideal? What happens when we are just having a bad day? We should take a look at our sources of error, including clock errors, ephemeris errors, and environmental errors. As we discussed last time, GPS receivers look at the travel time of the signal from the satellite to determine distance, and use multiple satellites with multiple distances to get a final position. But measuring travel time accurately is difficult, as the receiver clocks are mediocre and not synced up to the really nice satellite clocks. Those same satellite clocks do experience some drifting, but they transmit corrections for those errors in the nav message to the receiver. Basically, there's going to be a time difference between the two, and that time difference is going to translate into a kind of lousy distance measurement, also known as a pseudo-range. What we want is to find out the difference between the receiver and the satellite clock. That's where the fourth satellite comes in. By getting another observation, you can solve for delta t, or the time difference between the two clocks, thus reducing the error. You can't get rid of it entirely, as the GPS receiver clock can really only be accurate to the microsecond, or 0 0.000001 seconds. With an ideal speed of light of 671 million miles per hour, the ideal travel time to a GPS satellite 12,000 miles above the Earth is only about 60 milliseconds, and a satellite clock error of one nanosecond translates to about one foot of receiver positioning error. This is one of the reasons why many GPS devices you buy are accurate to anywhere from a couple of meters to 15 meters or more. Next up, ephemeris errors. When a satellite strays from its orbit, it has what is known as an ephemeris error, or deviation in a satellite's position or prescribed orbit. Ephemeris errors are generally caused by gravitational pull or solar radiation that moves them out of their original orbit. The U.S. Department of Defense monitors each GPS satellite by radar and updates their positions every hour in an almanac. This almanac is programmed into each GPS receiver, and it indicates where each satellite is in the sky at any given time. That information is transmitted every 30 seconds, but the almanac itself is only updated every hour or so. Any changes in position that take place over the last hour are unknown to the receiver and result in ephemeris errors. Finally, let's talk about environmental errors. Environmental errors include interference as the signals travel through space and our atmosphere, and interference with local obstructions, otherwise known as multipath error. The first of these is a bit complex, so let's just discuss the big points. We are constantly being bombarded by solar radiation. The Earth's atmosphere acts as a sort of filter, absorbing some parts of the radiation, such as harmful UV rays, UV radiation is ionizing, meaning that it strips away electrons from molecules in the atmosphere. The portion of our atmosphere that happens to affect our GPS signal the most is the ionosphere, as that is where you find the majority of the electrons created by solar radiation through ionization, hence the name. Every 11 years, we experience an increase in sunspots and solar activity, and a corresponding increase in the total number of electrons per unit area, known as the total electron count, or TEC. One TEC is equal to 10 quadrillion electrons per square meter. These electrons cause problems in two big ways. One, the GPS signal can experience a change in group velocity and create an unexpected delay known as a ranging error. One TEC is equivalent to roughly 16 centimeters of ranging error. You can see that values around 20 to 30 TEC are common in the United States. Two, the signal can be scattered by the electrons, creating patterns of constructive and destructive amplitude interference, which causes noise and interferes with the signal lock. This phenomena is known as scintillation. Scintillation is generally described using the S4 index, which is a 0 to 1 scale, with anything above 0.6 being strong and anything under 0.3 unlikely to affect your signal. You can find predictions for these values online, and even plan operations, knowing what ionospheric interference to expect. Multipath error is a bit easier to understand and explain. The whole idea of GPS is that a signal goes straight from the satellite to the receiver. But what if it gets there by bouncing off a building first? This happens all the time, 
where a signal for one satellite arrives at a receiver a bunch of different times. One of those signals was a straight line, but many were reflections. Fortunately, modern receivers use processing tricks to determine which of the signals arrived first and is the genuine signal. Unfortunately, you can only do so much, as a slight delay could also be attributed to other sources of error, such as the aforementioned ionospheric interference. Finally, we can get an idea of our total GPS error budget. By combining all of the things we just discussed with your p dot value, you can get an idea of how accurate your positioning really is, which for GPS is about 10 to 15 meters in the horizontal and roughly twice that in the vertical. Clearly we need a solution that is accurate to more than 30 meters in the vertical, especially if we are to survey to the ellipsoid. There are a number of technologies currently in place to provide an even more accurate solution, such as the U.S. Coast Guard-owned DGPS service and the NOAA-owned CORS network, or Continuously Operating Reference Station. These technologies, along with many others, can get us a more accurate solution. More on that in the final part of this trilogy. Thanks for watching, and good luck out there.